my background is um, I'm the head of education, I'm a lawyer and look after a lot of um, schools, colleges, some universities, probably about 450 establishments across the UK. Um, data protection has, we've definitely seen a rise in the way that people are uh, looking at education sector establishments as to how their data is being treated and safeguarded and kept secure. So over the past, past few years, we've certainly seen a rise in people saying, what are you doing with my data? Who's got access to it? Can I have access to it? I want a copy of everything you've got. Um, so we help schools and colleges when they're faced with those sorts of issues, subject access requests. So the first thing I want to ask is who's heard of GDPR? Can I have a show of hands? Oh, wow, yeah, you're all on it. That's good. Um, who knew the Data Protection Bill was published last week? A couple of you, yeah, a couple of you. Have you read it? I haven't, haven't yet. I haven't. When well, I was preparing for this, and we knew it was coming out because we work quite closely with the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, and we speak at conferences with them. We knew it was coming. We knew it was going to be in the first couple of weeks. Um, so I haven't read it yet, but I will do. I don't think it's that relevant apart from a couple of things relating to children, but, but I'll get onto that in a moment. This is really a fly through on things that ought to be on your horizon, really. So in order to understand where you're coming from, can I have an idea as to who here is involved in admissions? Anybody involved in the admissions side? Okay, and then marketing? Most of you, I think, yeah. Um, fundraising? Got some fund a couple of fundraisers there. Okay, that's helpful just to kind of see where we're going. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a fly-through. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end, or please just pop me an email um, if that would help. So, a little bit about data protection. You obviously all know what data protection is. The Data Protection Act, anybody know, anybody know the date of that? I've left it off deliberately. You can shout out if you know. No? 98. That's really old. It's a really old Act of Parliament, and so it, it doesn't actually cover or cater for the, for the way in which we use personal data nowadays. Um, so it's pre-everything that we generally do with our data. Um, what is personal data and how that, is, uh, how that is defined under the Act? We were hoping with GDPR there would be a better definition because what constitutes personal data has been the subject of quite a few legal decisions, as I'm sure you can imagine. There are some cases that say a person's name could, I, could be their personal data. And there are others that say, actually, unless it's got some other identifying feature that identifies that individual, it's not. So we were hoping with GDPR that would be clarified. Unfortunately, the definition is still fairly lengthy, so that's, that's not great. But really, it's about um, data from which you can identify an individual, something about them. It can be an opinion, it can be any kind of detail, so, and it can be anything that you've written possibly, or usually kept in some sort of electronic format. And it's important because people have a right to see what you're holding about them, obviously, and the principles under the Data Protection Act are pretty much going to follow through into GDPR. So in terms of education, the, the list there are the types of places where we find personal data. So it can be what we call the journey of life from an individual who first contacts you. So there's your pre-marketing, that, that's fine, and I'll talk about marketing in more detail, but from that first registration, immediately you're dealing with their personal data and through the sort of life journey of what you're doing. And that will take on different forms, obviously, as that individual goes through um, your establishment. That and how you treat that data will differ depending upon the age of the individuals in your establishment. So if you've got younger, um, if you've got young children, pupils, those that are under the age now of 13, you're obviously going to be looking for the parents. Um, so the how you treat that data is going to be really important, but those are kind of the key areas. In terms of processing, when I talk about processing, um, that means doing anything with it, destroying it, filing it, um, obtaining it, that's all of that is in effect processing. And it's what you do with it um, that, that really counts. So, I don't know why I did this, sorry, I'm not very, I like tech, but not that much. Um, so, GDPR, um, it comes into force next May, absolutely that date's not changing. There was a lot of talk when we had Brexit that actually 
um, they weren't going to bring it in. But of course, we've, now we've got the two year period in any event. So GDPR is, or the new Data Protection Act is going to come into force on the 25th of May. There's not going to be, as far as we're aware, any transitional period to allow you to kind of get up to speed. So this period between now and then is really important. And I'll talk about what you might be doing in the moment. Brexit doesn't matter. It might matter in the future um, because if we don't abide by European decisions on data protection, then ultimately the UK, we could be ploughing our own field and we might have to do a privacy shield or something, but that's way down the line um, if we decide to come out of it. <coughs> It does have some, some discretion within it that member states can adopt, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it applies to all data for citizens within the EU, whether that's processed in the EU or processed outside of the EU. So if the data that you've got relates to an EU citizen, and I should say it has to be a living individual, so if you're an archivist, some of your data won't be personal data within this definition, it will apply even if you're processing it elsewhere. It also applies to goods and services that are coming and are targeted at EU citizens. So if you've got an organisation that is outside the EU, but that you contract with or connect with, they will have to be GDPR compliant if they're coming into um, the UK or into, into Europe. I hope that makes sense. OK, the key... I just want to pick out the key points. Okay, so in terms of data protection, the, the good news is, if you know data protection, the eight principles, that architecture, as we call it, is going to stay pretty much the same. That's not radically going to um, change at all. But some rights we know are going to be strengthened, in particular those relating to some individual rights. So, for example, we know already that subject access requests, where people ask for their data, and we are getting, we tend to get them from students, we get them from disgruntled third parties, that we might have their data for, all sorts really. Um, the time period for dealing with those subjects access requests is, is shrinking to a period of a month and that creates difficulties for educational establishments because we've got holidays. I don't. I work at a law firm, we don't have any holidays at all. But, but um, you know, you've got holidays. The fact that you're on holiday makes no difference. So you don't get any, any give or anything because there's nobody there to deal with it. And quite often we will get a parent that will put in a subject access request on the last day of term. And we, you know, the, the, the school or college or university has, has to deal with it. So those rights are going to be strengthened. The right to be forgotten, which I'm not really going to mention again, that's really a new right. You remember the case where there was the right to be forgotten case a couple of, of years ago where somebody wanted something removed from Google? You probably remember that where they said, every time you put in a search engine, this crops up about me. I don't want that to crop up. Well, that again is going to be strengthened um, under GDPR. Um, the main thing I think that I want you to, to, to take away today is the sort of accountability, the compliance side of it, which under Data Protection Act, we have not had to physically demonstrate. Um, so that's, and, and I really, I don't want to scaremonger anyone. From my own personal viewpoint, I think a lot of it is common sense. If it's not clear that you've got consent, if it's not clear that you've got something, you probably haven't. So from that basis, it's quite a practical. Is it obvious they've allowed us to use their data for that purpose? If it's not blindingly obvious, you probably haven't got it. So it's that move away from a kind of very generic, can I use it for this or that purpose? Um, so common sense, but accountability is actually going to be uh, very key. We're also going to have mandatory breach reporting. Now, lots of organisations, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands if you have re reported a breach uh, already, lots of most organisations we look after have had some sort of breach under the current Data Protection Act purely because of human error. Um, you'll get individuals that lose laptops that, unfortunately, that will leave the laptop open on the uh, desk, they get called away, and uh, the students around it uh, like bees to a honeypot. And uh, we've had pupils hack into system, copy personal data, send it out, all sorts, really. So you have to accept that actually uh, that, that mistakes will happen. So I think that's your sort of starting point, really. Um, and I'll talk about risk assessment shortly. But this mandatory breach reporting is going to be new. So it means that you will have to report to the Information Commissioner's Office when you've had a breach under GDPR. 
It's kind of there at the moment already. Lots of people do it. We quite often say if there's been a serious breach of personal data, particularly if it's what we call sensitive personal data, so medical, religious, something like that that's not, you know, name, address, etc., um, we'll usually say you should probably notify the ICO because it puts you on the front foot. Tell them what you're doing, how are you responding to it, and I'll talk again about that in a minute. Data protection impact assessments, I'll mention those, and there are higher penalties, but I don't, I don't think there's an intention, when we speak to the ICO, which we do fairly frequently, there's no intention to be punitive on this and to hammer people and say, you haven't done this. That is simply not their approach. They're quite practical. Their website's really useful for updates. Their blog's quite good. Um, but it is about getting people to take care of the data that they've got within their, uh, within their control. So, and that's really repeating a lot of that. It's number two that's across that's probably the most important. It's that demonstrating compliance. So from my perspective as a lawyer and as a, as a, a, a trustee of a school, um, I see GDPR as a huge risk to my organisation at the moment. It's flashing a big red and it should be a red for most organisations. What you want to do is you want to just turn that amber or green by taking st certain steps to demonstrate compliance. So what you want to do is think about your organisation and identify where your risks might be. And we'll talk about data mapping in a sec. Um, so if I was a school, for example, as I was, as I was an independent school, um, then parents and their personal data that I handle, if I'm do something I shouldn't do with that data. If I send them a fundraising letter and they haven't consented, my view is it could be a breach of the act, but actually parents might expect a certain amount of intrusion. They might have, you know, they might think, oh, well, they're asking me to contribute to build a new block or performing arts centre or something. So the risk of that is fairly low. It's not to say it's not a breach, but the risk is quite low. Um, my biggest risks really are in relation to certain types of data that I hold. If I've got medical data on students, that's quite high risk. How do I keep that secure? And my outward facing, so the stuff that you do, where I'm externally facing with organisations that I've got no relationship with whatsoever, but I want to form a relationship. That is where I think the risk is. And so um, most organisations we talk to, it's the marketing, the fundraising, alumni. How dare you contact me? I never want to hear from you ever again. <laughs> We've had a few of those emails. Um, that's your biggest risk because they've got no, no loyalty to you. They've got no relationship. So I think you've got to look at your own organisation and see what your risks uh, might be. Um, it's not all bad news. Yeah, it's not all bad news. So how do you do that? So we're doing this lot, lots of organisations. You can do it yourself. There's lots of tools out there. You've got to map your data. Has anybody started doing this? Has anybody done it? Anybody started looking at what you've got? No, okay, that's, that's fine. We're doing it for quite a few. I mean, lots of people have waited for the bills to come out and there will be codes of practice from the ICO. Um, I will send these slides, people that are taking photos. Um, I'll give them to, to Matthew. You'll distribute the slides, won't you, Matthew? He's nodding at me. Um, map your data. Um, you will probably only have one part of that, but the organisation that you work for as a whole should be thinking, we need to look at what data we've got. And it's quite common in an organisation, uh, most organisations we talk to, that some of them have five or six databases. They're all under different, so marketing have their own database, admissions have their own database, there'll be a medical database, there'll be a parent, there's all sorts of, and it's a bit like Pandora's box. Um, you open it and, and you sometimes wish you hadn't. And that's just because the way that we've used data has, has developed over the past 15 years, I suppose, in particular. So, and the amount of data has increased. So trying to keep a hold of what we've got. And that's not talking about your commercial contracts. So if you contract something out to a service provider, if you use a third party for marketing, it's all those relationships as well, those commercial contracts that will have to be GDPR compliant. So map your data, even if it's just your area, know what you've got. And we'll talk about consents and are your consents enough. You might already have what we call soft consents, so sort of opt-in consents where you think actually they're, they, they're, I'm, I'm not going to get a fresh consent, but I'll, I'll, I'll accept the consent I've got. You could do what we call a health check, which is a kind of overview and a soft touch, really. And that's just looking quite high level at what data you've got. So you might speak to people in your team or you might be asked to provide a report on the risks 
So what activities do you carry out? Who are you targeting? I'll talk about wealth, screen, uh, wealth screening in a minute, but or you can do a full audit. Now that's really in depth and obviously the organization itself would do that, but there are various levels. No requirement to do that under GDPR or indeed under the Data Protection Act, but if you've done that exercise, what it should do is it should identify your risks, so where you might have a little gap. Um, so you might think you, that you know what they do in admissions. Who sends that format? When do we send it? What do we do with that data once we've got it? Where does it go on the system? Um, are our system, so if you've got a system, are they compliant with GDPR? Um, that data mapping ex exercise, if you've done it, if you did have a breach, one of the great things you can say to the ICO is, well, we, you know, we take this very seriously. We've mapped our data, we've looked for this, and set out what you've done. They always want to know what have you done, what training, you know, how, how have you approached it. I have to keep coming out because I'm fairly short. Can't see you all. Okay, so the ICO have got a 12 steps checklist. Um, that's actually for schools. They've got an education sector guidance on it, if you've all had a look at that. They are updating those, that checklist. We've got a note. Um, which I'm happy to forward to you if you want to pop me an email. Um, it's on our website. Um, but the ICO have been updating it as they go. They're a little bit, not behind, but sometimes the stuff they're putting out, people want it more quickly. But because we've just, just had the bill, it's not always possible for them to get it out. I think the blog's quite good, so just keep an eye on that. What they're going to do is release... Um, I'll get to it here, codes of practice and codes of conduct, as they call them there. So, um, demonstrating compliance. This is going to be your, your biggie, as it were, because if you have a breach, you want to be able to say, well, this is what we, this is what we do with our, our data. So, and this is Article 5, so it's taken from um, the regulations, GDPR itself, and it will come into the bill. Um, so you've got to have technical and organisational measures put in place to demonstrate compliance. So the technical side of it is generally IT, it's the management of your databases. So who looks after that and who ensures that that personal data is secure? That's going to be one of the, the, the biggies. So a kind of review of that would help you demonstrate that and document it and you can satisfy that. Organisational measures. That's who's got responsibility for what, who puts that data in, who can extract it, who says we can use that database. So it's very, very practical um, from that basis, um, looking at who, who does what within your organisation, and that will vary. Um, impact assessments, um, and that's really data protection by, by design. You've probably all heard of that. So the idea behind this is if you are introducing a new system of any sort, uh, whether that's a new um, IT system that looks at a particular product or doing something with personal data, you now, privacy impact assessments have been around for a long time and there's some really good guidance on the ICO website about them, but you will have to do them if you're introducing something which handles personal data. But that's quite good because that's your risk assessment, isn't it? So we're going to introduce this system. How might that impact on people's privacy? And because you've, you've only, you're only allowed to keep the data for which it was gathered, you're not allowed to repurpose it, I use it for a different purpose. Um, and you've got to have their consent. So actually it's quite a good exercise and should help you demonstrate compliance. Um, the requirement to appoint a data protection officer, that's voluntary for some organisations. If you're a public body and that's not defined in um, GDPR, then you will have a mandatory data protection officer. So generally a public body we say here is somebody who's subject to the Freedom of Information Act. So if you're a public sector, you're in receipt of public funding, then you, um, public sector funding, then you will have to appoint a mandatory data protection officer. I'm not going to talk anymore about them. That's a whole different, nobody wants to be one of those. <laughs> have I got any here? Is anybody a data protection officer here? No, don't volunteer. Don't volunteer for that. It's a huge job. You've got to be technically expert in data protection. It's quite, well, it's quite a task, I think, to do it. The codes of conduct that the ICO are going to release will be the flesh on the bones of the bill. So I've had a quick look at the bill. It's really hard work. I mean, I was looking at the children's bit, particularly interested me because we've been waiting for them to say what date a child will um, be able to look at their own data. We know it's 13. We thought it was. It is now confirmed as 13. 
but the codes of conduct will be really helpful. They're going to be released as we go. So I would just keep, my best advice is keep an eye on the, um, the website. The other thing you have to do under GDPR is, is set out, and you've kind of had to do this before, but you didn't have to clarify it. GDPR expects you to do a lot more, if that makes sense. So you've got to be able to demonstrate what's your reason for processing that, that data. And so it comes in in two angles, really. You've got special category data, which is, of course, something that's medical or religious beliefs, or something like that. There's also general, general processing of data that might be necessary, for example, for the purposes of a contract, or it's necessary to have your bank details in order that I pay you. That's why I need your, that's why I need your name and address. Um, so there are different purposes, and obviously different things apply. Um, the sensitive data, the special data, you need explicit consent. That's the old law, remains the same. Um, this is the definition of consent. I'm not going to linger on it because I'm going to whiz through. I don't know why I did this, sorry, with the little coming in thing. These are my sort of key. If you're thinking about have we got consent, this is what I'd like you to just think about. And it comes from the definition. So the fully informed. So do they know what you're actually going to use that, their data for? So you can't have a general marketer. You know, you should have something that's fairly. So if you use it for marketing, if you can use it for fundraising, really you should tell them that includes, because fundraising and marketing are different. Um, if you're going to use it for wealth screening, that's very different. Um, has to be freely given, capable of being withdrawn. So that's, your, that's all about your, your opt-in boxes, not your opt-out boxes. Has to be specific, so relating to the purpose for which you're processing. And ambiguous, I love that. I mean, I, they can't get the definition of personal data short, so I don't know how we're going to get uh, all the consents. Uh, I've seen consents that are fairly lengthy at the moment. Most consents are being pulled out. They're not being buried in contracts. They're being pulled out and being written quite specifically. Um, a statement or clear affirmative action. We think, and we're waiting to hear from the ICO on this, but we think that you'll still be able to, if you had um, a, um, a con an electronic consent, we believe um, that you will still be able to just allow the individual to click a you know, and consent by doing that, and you won't have to give them all the information, but they can access it elsewhere. So a layering. We still think that that's going to be okay under GDPR. We're waiting for guidance from the ICO on that. Because what you don't want to do is give everybody, here's consent and here's the list of, I mean, everyone will get really tired of that, won't they? Um, so we still think that, that layering, so if you've got, if you use, um, you know, any sort of service or text or something for getting that consent, you'll still be able to do that, hopefully. But again, we'll have um, more guidance on that. Um, so your data mapping should flush out what consent you've got. That's really the key. So if you've got, um, if you are targeting particular individuals or if you are the use of individual images on the website, we would always, always say you need that specific consent because a photograph, as you know, um, is someone's personal data, as is someone's image on CCTV. Uh, um, you might not need to rely on consent, i.e. you've ticked a box. It might be that you can rely on another ground necessary for contract, legal obligations. That might be for some matters where we have to do this because. Um, an example of that might be, we had, we had a, a school recently, the NHS have started you know, the vaccination programmes that go on in schools. And the NHS wanted to gather the data for the pupils at the school uh, through electronic means. They haven't done that before. And so they wanted us to consent. Now, of course, the parents, really, we've got to ask the parents, do you consent to us sharing your child's data with the NHS for the purpose of these vaccinations? And the NHS have to set out, you know, are they going to keep that information safe? Is that necessary for the contract? Probably not. Having a vaccination at school is not a necessary part. The, the contract is the provision of educational services. That's what you'll be doing at whatever level, whether you're a university or a college or a school. So you've got to think about um, for what reason you're using those um, consents. I'm not going to really talk too much about privacy notices, apart from to say that they're going to be longer. Um, and this is really what they've got to include, um, which is the purpose of processing their data. So why are you doing it? And the legal basis for the processing. In the majority of cases with marketing, it will be consent, and you'll need their explicit consent to do that because it wouldn't usually be necessary for the performance of the contract. 
can't see how that how that would be. It might be, but um, usually, if you're going to share the personal data with somebody else, that should be in the privacy notice. You haven't got to say who that person is because obviously. If you contract with a third party to do some marketing on your behalf, you might not know who they are or you might change a provider. So it doesn't have to be that we're going to share it with ABC company. It has to be we will share your data for the purpose of. So it has to be really clear um, within that and the fact that they can um, uh, withdraw it if, if they want to. And they've got a right to complain. That's got to be in your privacy notice, I'm sorry. I don't think many people will read the privacy notices, but people tend to read these things when they've got a complaint. Um, that's what we find. Right, so um, this is where we tend to see personal data being used. Um, and I'm going to talk very briefly about the um, privacy and electronic communications regulations. So, um, uh, lots of do lots of you use third party service providers for marketing or do you do it all in house? Do you do service providers or no? Yes, talk to me people. Yes, no, shake your hat, shake your head. Yes, you do. Some of you do, some of you don't, that's helpful. So if you do, and I'll talk about a third party, where you ask somebody to do something on your behalf, um, that will certainly change under um, GDPR. Postal campaigns and email and telephone campaigns, pretty much as it was before, but you'll need to make sure that your consents for that purpose are much tighter. Um, and again, um, the idea behind it is that actually um, you hopefully will still be, if, if somebody's consent is already on your database, you haven't got to go out, we're saying you haven't got to go out and get fresh consent, because if they're already there, we're calling that the soft consent. Um, I just want to touch on this, privacy and electronic communications regulations. It's separate from GDPR, it will still be there. So this is, um, these are the regulations that govern electronic um, marketing by email, fax, I don't know if anybody still uses the fax. Um, uh, but if you're emailing people, then these regulations, will, which originally came from the EU, will still sit alongside that. Um, so there won't be a change there, and it will still be enforced by the ICO. There might be some occasions where actually it doesn't fall because it's not electronic, so it might be a postal campaign. That will still be sub that will be subject to GDPR or the new Data Protection Act, if that makes sense. But this will still um, be there. If you have the data of the individuals, you'll be a data controller. So you'll be controlling that data. You'll probably be using data processors, so you might ask other people to process that data on your behalf. And um, the importance of this is that generally, under the current law, if you're the data controller, you are solely responsible if something goes wrong with that data. But under GDPR, if you contract something to a third party, that third party, who are really a processor, but not a controller, could also be um, liable for the, for the ICO and their range of uh, sanctions that they have. So your contractual obligations, and I did put a slide in, but I took it out because it was far too wordy, but I can send it all to you if you want to know what you should put in your contract. Should your contracts with your service providers are really key. You have to set out that they'll comply with GDPR. You have to limit what they're doing with that data, only using it for that purpose, because ultimately you want them to be tied to you so that you're not the sole one responsible for that data. But that's quite, this is quite good in a way because it, it, it gives you a bit of a stick to beat them with. Hopefully there's no um, service providers here, but if there is, you need, you need to be uh, looking at your contracts. Um, I've talked about that, I've talked about all of... Um, it's, I mean, this is, for me, it's a key area where you're going to have to demonstrate that accountability and compliance if you're doing school development and fundraising. Um, some organisations I know uh, do do either wealth screening or they target particular individuals um, for a donation. Um, or as part of a fundraising uh, project, just because they say, well, their information's in the public arena. Um, or I saw them on LinkedIn, and so I wanted to contact them for that purpose. Strictly speaking, under GDPR, you're not permitted to do that because their, their information is out there, not for fundraising purposes. Their information has not been put out there so that you can contact them for a donation or ask them if they'd like to contribute. Um, I don't know if any of you do wealth screening, but if you do, then... If it's of current people that you have a relationship with, you will have to tell them that you're doing that. So if you've got a general sort of 
opt-in consent at the moment, what we call the soft opt-in, because they've been on your database for a while. I'm not suggesting you cull your databases, don't, don't do that. If you've got that soft opt-in, um, if you're using that for sort of general marketing, this is what we're doing, would you like to come along? We're having such and such, that's fine. But if you're doing something beyond that, such as wealth screening, then my advice would be that you, you'd have to think about getting specific consent for that from that individual, because that's not generally considered something that you would be doing with their data or targeting particular individuals. You have to kind of think of a way um, around that. Um, if you've got uh, any alumni, I just wanted to mention here that if you've got alumni, um, when they leave your organisation, <coughs> please make sure you get a fresh consent. Because when somebody comes into your school or your college or university, they are coming in for the purpose of receiving a particular service, an education. That's why they're contracting with you or engaging with you. Um, and if they're, if they're young and their parents contract, Again, you will have their um, consent to process their data for the purposes of providing that education to their child. But when their child has left, that consent is no longer valid because that, the relationship has changed. So you're, when you go back to your lawful process for, for processing data, when we're talking about consent, necessary for the contract, for most individuals it will be necessary in order to allow you to carry out the education, provide the education to those individuals. Um, but you're not going to be doing that once they've left, but you still want to keep in touch. So you, will, you should be getting fresh consents um, if you want to keep in contact with them. Most organisations do that before they've left, because if they do after they've left, they just ignore it and it's really hard to get in contact with them again. Um, so um, think about that changing relationship that you will have. And of course, if it's a student, if they are under 18, by the time they get to 18, they'll, they'll be able to, they should have their own um, consent anyway. Um, and, and think about who owns the data, particularly with alumni. We find in a number of organisations that the Alumni Association is set up as a separate legal entity. It's a separate company, although it might be connected. And so you might have to have a data sharing agreement um, between the two parts of the organisation. So just have, that's just something to flag. Um, so just have a look at it, see what you do, um, and um, try and try and make the most of this bit of time. Really, if there's a breach, what have you got to do? Be on absolutely be on the front foot. A lot of data protection is just about common sense, isn't it? And, and saying hands up, yeah, we did something wrong. I'm really really sorry, and this is what we've done. Um, so you might have to self-report to the ICO. There will be some mandatory breach reporting. We're not clear exactly where that's going to fall yet. Um, why did it happen? What have you done? Like anything, really. When you've made a mistake, we did this. Sorry, it shouldn't have happened. It did happen. And these are the steps we've taken. How do we communicate? So if it's a breach of um, personal data, did you tell the individuals that their personal data had been disclosed or whatever had happened to it? Really, you should be telling them. Most people are all right about that. Um, we've had to do that a few times um, for organisations where there has been a breach and their data has been hacked or uh, we had one where somebody managed to display a lot of information on a website. Don't ask how they did that, but obviously that was quite upsetting for the individuals involved. So we had to, you know, but we told them about it and they say, OK, I don't like, I'm not happy with you, but thanks for telling me. What are you doing about it? Um, and then you have to think about, could we have prevented it? And what training have we got? Because still, when we go back to the ICO guidance, you'll see that actually a lot of um, these things can be prevented by encryption, you know, by just making people use the data safely. Um, so think about training. Training is not mandatory under GDPR. It's not mandatory under um, the current Act, but it's quite a good idea um, if you've got people that are handling, particularly across an organisation, if they're handling um, personal data in a particular format. I've got a little case study for you. I've got one minute to do this. Um, so this was something that a school actually came to me and said, oh, we want to do this, or something very similar to it. So they wanted to send Christmas cards to current and former parents. Actually, they didn't want to, they wanted to do something a bit, bit um, crazier than that, to current and former parents and pupils at the school. Is that all right, doing that? Nod, shake, yeah, nod. That's okay, isn't it? 
I mean, it's probably all right. People probably haven't consented to receiving a Christmas card, but actually, it's a nice thing. No one's going to complain. And I think if you've got that relationship with the school, then you'd expect, I think it's quite, I think the school could win a few brownie points if they did that. Um, so the fact that they haven't got consent, that's not part of the provision of education, sending someone a Christmas card. That does not, and they could upset a few people um, because it's a Christmas card, but, um, but actually they're unlikely to have people complain about it. They might think, oh, that was quite nice. That was a personal touch, I quite like that. Um, if um, it was to people, we've had another organisation that said, we don't want to send it to current parents, we want to send it to people in the area that might have children that want to come to the school. Um, and I said, ooh, how do you get their data? That's, so that's more difficult, because that's the reputation of the school. You're externally faced, so the risk associated with that was much greater, so they had to assure themselves as to who was giving them that database. Um, because whoever had given them the database, their details would be on there somewhere, but really the, par the prospective parents would see it as being from the school. So if they were going to be upset, it would be the school that would, that would have the PR issue to deal with. Um, if it was donation request forms, would that be any different? Probably would, wouldn't it? Because it's fu your fundraising. So if you're doing it for a different purpose, so parents expect you to contact them, be quite nice, that's fine. Fundraising, that is something that you're going to need specific consent for. Um, again, because it's parents and they've got a relationship, it might be slightly low risk, um, but there might be some parents that are on your I've opted out list that don't, don't want to receive anything. And if it was an email, um, you would definitely have to look at had they consented or not, because you um, have to have their consent to send an email under the Privacy and Electronic Communications regulations. So it's all little things for you to um, hopefully think about. That is a real fly through. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Um, any questions? <laughs> Thank you.